So here we are with another episode, and we're excited today to bring you this person, Fred Nicora, and he's coming to us from Milwaukee or outside Milwaukee. Where was it? Uh, actually, I live in Cedar Grove. Oh, Cedar Grove. Okay. Cedar Grove, and, Wisconsin. Yeah, we're talking. He... <laughs> yeah, rural Wisconsin. Rural Wisconsin is the best way to say it. Rural Wisconsin. Rural Wisconsin. And he has an adopting memoir out called Forbidden Roots. And we want to highlight that. We'll put that in our show notes. So welcome, Fred. Well, thank you very much. First of all, hey, I Fred, do want to welcome. say, hey, thank you. Um, I, I want to say thank you for having me on. I mean, it's it's truly an honor. And I've listened to a number of your podcasts. And you guys just do a stellar job with them. So I'm looking at the repertoire that I'm up against. That you, You've got some very interesting people. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting this morning as I was listening to a, a few of them, it just really highlights, you know, there, there are so many similarities between all of us and we relate to each other at such a deep, deep level, but yet yeah. at the same time, all our stories are different. Yeah. All of them are different, but yet they've all brought us to the same place. That's, that's the part that just fascinates. And they're, but they're all uh, rooted in the same thing, which is loss. There's a lot of loss. And, um, you know, it's amazing because when you start listening to some of the stories um, of who we didn't meet, who passed away before we had a chance to, you know, connect. Um, it It's heartbreaking. You know, there's a lot of heartbreak there, but yet at the same time, you, you look at us as a people and just the resiliency, the, the ability to absorb, um, adapt and move on, you know, because that's what the vast majority of of us have done. There's a lot of anger. You know, I've, I've seen that across the boards as well. And, and I'm going to say there's a lot of reason for that anger. you know mm -hmm. um, my story is it's a bit of a different story uh, from I'm a late discovery adoptee so I'm I'm not one who knew from early on I um, went through life I, I grew up in a suburb of Milwaukee Wisconsin Wauwatosa pretty big high school I went to 450 kids went there and actually interestingly enough and I'll get a little bit more into it later but I graduated with a cousin of mine who actually knew I was adopted <laughs> so yeah I know you mean I, an, I ad an adopted an adoptive cousin? Yes, yes. In my okay. adopted family, um, a cousin of mine that I had, um, I went to high school with her and she actually was aware I was adopted. And I grew up with her my whole life. I have a number of cousins, you know, I grew up with them. And it's kind of interesting. And I, I can touch on reunion and family because, you know, I, I went through that. And, um, you know, you, you meet all these people. And it, it's kind of funny, as a late discovery adoptee, there, there's a fair amount of you, you feel a sense of betrayal when you do find mm -hmm. out. I mean, I'm yeah, sure. I imagine. A lot of your foundation is based on trust of some very simple principles that just aren't true. And so that's loss. And it's kind of interesting as I shake it out uh, over the years and really examine it, um, it. The aunts and uncles, I'm not as pissed off at. I'm still kind of pissed off at my cousins. They were my peers, man. That's, mm -hmm. that's, who, I, that's who I hung with and snuck out with and did things I wasn't supposed to with, you know. And, yeah. you know, so did when you I look have at any, them, did you have any siblings? No, I didn't. I grew up as an only child. Okay. I, there was one point, and it was kind of interesting because it was in, in and I'll get to it, but the adoption records, uh, my parents had come gone back and thought about bringing another adopted baby into the household um, and then they backed off on it and I you know to some extent I can't help but one did they just not want to cross that bridge with me how do we explain this new this new baby that just emerges you know without mom being pregnant ever you know I mean maybe they just didn't want to cross it I, I have no way of telling because they actually had passed away before I found out so when so you they, found they they went to their they died without ever telling you now that th there's a little story there too <laughs> <laughs> there's a deathbed story coming up um and, and i'll i'll get to that and it uh it's a story that shows two things it, it shows um the need not to wait and it also shows the amazing ability of the mind to filter out what it doesn't want to hear at the time yeah. so um i'll get to that shortly but um well i guess i can throw it in now so i found out at the age of 41 uh, at a large family gathering. It was a twin uncle's birthday party. Both my parents had passed away already. 
my second parent, because I was raised an only child, my second parent passing, which was my mother, my father passed away in 93, my mother in 97, both died of cancer. Um, it was awful. I was with both mm -hmm. of them uh, at the end. And that, that's a story I'm going to tell you. And this was before I discovered. So, you know, she was the second to go. She died of throat cancer. Um, she had it, she had battled it probably for 25, 30 years, you know, and then finally toward the end when she was in her seventies decided she had had enough. She had lost enough through the battle and uh, just wanted to let it take her. And so she went through hospice and at the very end, um, you know, if you've been with somebody that is, is at that very end, mm -hmm. uh, they're pretty drugged up at that point. They're not making a lot of sense. They're kind of in and out of lucidity. And uh, she started mumbling something and keep in mind, she had throat cancer. Her speech was impacted significantly and I couldn't understand it. She was saying, oh, no, no, you're up. And, and I, and I, the only thing yeah. I could think to do was to comfort her mm -hmm. and um, say, I, I know, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I know, I know, you know, and then shortly after that, she did pass away. But um, I later, after I discovered, put it together, she was telling me I was adopted. I couldn't. Wow. Understand. It was incomprehensible to me at the time. You know, there were a couple of complicating factors, but, you know, I think that was, that was her come to Jesus moment because she had attempted to die. I know that sounds, that sounds crazy, but that's, mm -hmm. that's what I mean about all our stories. They're all so crazy. You know, you listen to this. She, if you've watched somebody go down, you know, there's signs that appear that their skin starts modeling. Yeah function shoot shut down their liver function you know all the signs and she went down the hole a couple of times and then always seemed to rebound and this was going on for you know a couple of weeks and nobody could figure out why and it was after that after she did her final I'm going to say confession yeah. at her bedside that she finally I think could let go and then um, she felt her work was done here you know and just did let go so anyway and you can put the words together. You're, I was with both my parents when they passed, my adopted parents, and watched both. And a lot of stuff happens then, and you don't understand what are they trying to tell me. And I can imagine you're, you wouldn't even know that that's the thing she's trying to tell you. No, and you know, and this this stuff's in my book too. Just by the way, but um, the the one of my biggest regrets, and it's not. I had no control over it. So I don't feel guilty about it. I don't beat myself up over it. But at that time, as she was dying, you know, being a person that wasn't consciously aware that they were adopted, I told her, I said, you know, mom, look, your, your, your grandchildren are able to just carry that genetic relay for you forward. <laughs> you know, my kids were playing at her bedside. I didn't mm -hmm. know. You know, what a, what a terrible thing to say to somebody, you know, really. Well, um, yeah. Uh, or not. You know I mean? Yeah. It was just kind of an awkward situation. But anyway, um, another example of why secrets are bad, I guess. I'll say. Yeah. You know. And and so, what, ha what happened at that barbecue? Was it a barbecue or a birthday no, party? No, so that was that was 97. She uh -huh. she passed away in 97. We were I was living with my wife and my three young children up in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis St. Paul area. We uh, lived there about 10 years. All three of my kids were born there. I had an uncontrollable desire to just get back down to Southeastern Wisconsin. You know, I'd say at the conscious level, I was uh, wanting my kids to be around extended family. I grew up around a large extended family on both sides, both my mother and my father. Now they were complicated families and, and I don't think we have time for that here. Um, I, I, I touch it a little bit in the book, not much. There's a, cause I've come to realize it more. There's so much generational trauma that, you know on both sides that are just piling into these relationships, you know. My father came from a family that got divorced in the 30s. He ended up in an orphanage for a while. Mm -hmm. He was the one that theoretically drove the decision for me not to know. He didn't want me mm -hmm. to, to have to live, according to his sister, with the horrors of being an orphan. You know, that that was. That's where he came from. Yeah, that's where. Yeah, that's that, that was, was his who, that was his imprint. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was that was affected. You know what affected him? My mother was a um, her father. Uh, she had a sister, and then uh, after she was born, she was a second. Um, her mother died, and her father remarried. Um, so my mother was, I'm going to say, a classic Cinderella stepdaughter. Oh, you know, me too. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about that. I, I am exactly that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's kind of an interesting, you know. After I put all the pieces together, so then you start looking at these two people coming from this, these dysfunctional, you know, backgrounds of, you know 
basically hurt and shame the way it is and, and then all of a sudden throw them in, in the mix. And honestly, my parents did a great job with me. I love my parents dearly. They, they were wonderful to me. They sacrificed for me. I, I believe I felt love from them. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I would say the, the one qualify, qualifier there is, um, you know, I, I struggle with the thought of how, how valid is a relationship if you're harboring a secret that big, you know, yeah. and, and that even ties into, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, but even my birth mother who I had reunion with and, and she, she was, she went to the grave with the shame. She could not shed that. And it impacted so much. And I look at that and, and just think it's such a tragedy that she had to live from the time she was 22 up till the time she was 70, harboring that shameful secret mm. that she had a, keep hidden away in the closet and be afraid at every turn, you know, over. Um, so it's, you know, I, I look back, so I'm a classic baby scoop, babe, you know, uh, baby or a baby. Yeah. Um, I lived in 1959. Um, so in the year 2000, I, I had convinced my wife that we were going to move back to the Milwaukee Metro. I had gotten some money through the inheritance from my mother. I bought a, a home down here in, in the immediate area, right by another uncle of mine that I was close to. Um, it, it was it was a hard decision to come to she, my ex and now ex-wife loved being in the Twin Cities she hated to leave um, I desperately for some reason wanted to get back here um, and the funny thing is once I got back I I noticed that you know I'm thinking I'm going to get back to the area I'm going to have my kids all of a sudden we're going to be getting together with cousins and that you know and it was like all of a sudden they nobody was around you know it's like where did everybody go you know and to some extent, I think, well, my mother had passed. She was the reinforcer of the secret, you know, and I think when she passed, the rest of the family just kind of felt like it was kind of a mess and they didn't want to deal with it, you know? So to some extent, I, I was kind of removed from many of them, but the one uncle that I moved close to, he was a twin and he had a, a birthday party with his twin uncle. So they were my uncles, Rich and Bob, and it was down at a large restaurant, about 200 to 300 people. Um, were there. And while I was at the bar getting beverages for me and my wife my and my three kids, I returned to the table and my wife looked at me and she pointed to a woman and said, is that Alice? And I knew exactly what she meant by that because Alice was known to get everything confused. She was kind of a messed up woman who just didn't couldn't keep facts straight. And I said, no, that that's actually Lydia. Why? What'd she say? She's sharp as a tack. And she said, she said, she's known you since the day they adopted you. Oh. And I said, what? She said, she's known you since the day they adopted you. I fractured. Yeah. I, my head fell apart. Oh my God. Did, did you, did you feel that it was true? Like mm -hmm. hearing that? Uh, boy, that's, that is a tough one to call from the standpoint of at that moment, um, it all made sense yet nothing made sense. Yeah. And I, know that I can't even imagine anything. being 41 years old and, and both of your adopted parents dead and then finding out that you were adopted. That is just, that must've just upended your life. Well, it's y yes, it did. It did. It did upend my life. It, it took away my foundation. You know, yeah. I yeah. The house, I suddenly had a, a sharp undertow that just swept the foundation. And so then, you know, it's cruel in a way. I mean, it's just, it's cruel. Uh, the, the outcome was cruel, uh, you know, in terms of how I found out and when I found out probably isn't anything anybody would have designed into their life story. You know, mm -hmm. um, what I would say is at the same time, you know, I, I can look back at my parents I can look at, you know, what their situations were, what was driving their behavior, at least based on what I'm told, because, you know, I, I didn't get to talk to them about it. One of my biggest regrets is that we were never able to reprocess that together. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I think that could have, I believe that could have really led to a flourishing and a whole different level of those relationships developing, because quite honestly, I don't know about the two of you, but I can look at the job of being an adoptive parent, I, I don't, honestly, I don't know if I could do it. You know, yeah. it's, it's a tough job. It's a tough, I, I have three of my own that I raised and 
I think it's a tougher job than raising your own. You know, I mean, there are so many things you have to be aware of. And I mean, today we're, we're much more aware of it, which I'm going to say, thank God. I think the adoptions, how the relinquishments are, are being held or handled today is much healthier than it was, you know, in 59, 60. I, hope so. I, I mean, maybe to some extent, but also, I don't know. I, ha- I, I don't know that that's different. There's a different set of problems. Let's just put it that way. There are, there are. And, you know, I mean, the, the reality is there's always going to be issues. I think it's a bigger financial industry now than it, than it was then. Well, that's how I'd agree with you. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's a big bear to battle. And I don't have a sword that big, quite honestly. Right. <laughs> no. but what I can say my goal, my goal, um, and it's what I'm working toward is, you know, and it's why I speak, why, why I'm talking to you. Why, and I've been talking on a few podcasts, you know, I put my book out there. I think the more voices we can get telling our stories, the better the likelihood that we will see meaningful change. Yeah. I mean, it's only, but, and we have to get louder. We have to get more voices out there. We have to get more stories. We have to get people to understand that this is not a one and done Oprah situation, that this is happening all over the place. But the, the, you're are, not, you're not getting, first of all, the, the, I have a, the whole thing about just wanting a baby as opposed to a child that needs you. Yeah. It's two, tif- two, two different things, but um, that the babies are not blank slates that yeah. you can just bring into your life and pretend they they didn't have an existence before that. Well, that's, you know, and, and I'm going to, yeah, and trust me, I've gone through my share and, and I did a lot of it with a bottle, put it that way for many years. I, I ran into a problem <laughs> with alcohol. I, I think it was before we started recording here. I'm, I'm sober 13 years now. So at this point, you know, I can look at it and, and I'd say, see it at, from a different view. Um, becoming sober was essential for me to figure out how to start to heal. And I'm going to say, if anybody's out there grappling with how to start healing, don't think you'll heal first and get sober second. Mm-hmm. That's my, that's my take on. I agree with you 100%. But, but you got to do the sober thing first and you got a good message. Thing. It's a good message. Cause I think a lot of people, I still, you know, even as I talk on, you know, whether it's group chats or whatever it is, you know, I'll still, catch people, you know, making references to their drinking and, you know, going out and, you know, and it's fine. Okay. You know, you, you need to know where your boundaries are. You need to know what works for you and what doesn't, but you know, you really want to dive into that healing stuff, you know, at least for me growing up when I did, you know, that was, that was society's resolve for any kind of an uncomfortable situation. Yeah. Drink get it. a drink. Mm-hmm. Numb it down, yeah. man. Just numb it down, toughen it up, numb it down. You know, that's what you got to do. So. so, all right. So take us back to the sitting at that table. Uh, she w- She's known you since you were adopted. Yeah. So I immediately picked out, you know, I, I gazed at her across the room. You know, um, this was, you know, there were these large banquet tables and everybody. It's a loud, gregarious. That family is very loud, you know, um, and, and they're, they're, they're wonderful people. They're, they really are. They're Polish and German and uh, primarily Polish, some Hungarian in there. So they're, they're just a, what I'm gonna call a very Gregorious, happy, you know, loud and loud people. So the environment was like that. So I went over to her and I, um, I just went up, hi Lydia. Um, and, and she looked at me and she goes, oh, Freddie, your children are so beautiful and your wife is so lovely. And I said, did you tell my wife you've known me since the day I was adopted? And she froze, you know, I, her hands came up, just framed her face, you know, and I was like, oh my God, you didn't know I shouldn't have. And, you know, the, the most remarkable thing that I can say that happened physically to me at that point was at that point, I remember noticing I could no longer feel the floor beneath my feet, that the sensation was like I jumped out of a plane. I hadn't pulled the parachute. It's floating. Yeah, I I wasn't afraid of it because I knew it. I wasn't going to die from it, but it really was uncomfortable. And I carried that feeling for about two and a half months. And it was crazy trying to navigate life where I'm just like, okay, but I don't feel the floor down there. (laughs) This is crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, Well, it's like everything's untrue that you knew to be true. And 
I went through a little bit of this, not with adoption, with another secret that was in my life. And I felt like everything wasn't what it was. It's very upsetting on your brain, like how to process, right? Yeah. And I, I overloaded, I just, I overloaded Mm -hmm. and I actually spent part of that day and part of the next day, um, just, I'm going to say shaking down anybody I could find. I I drove around to houses (laughs) trying to catch them on the surprise, thinking that if, if they had time, they'd probably try and create a new lie. You know, I mean, I was a little whacked out and I, I feel bad for who I all shook down, you know, after that, but at the did same Lydia, time, did I, Lydia did not give you any more details. She really didn't know much else. And at that point, I didn't even stick around to find out. I just okay. gathered my wife, my kids and got out of there. I, I just couldn't, I, I knew I couldn't deal with it there. I, the last thing I wanted to do, because there was a large side of me that suddenly, even though I had always been vulnerable, <laughs> the vulnerability suddenly was exposed. And, and, and I, you know, and I, I make an analogy to it. I felt like the emperor in the emperor's new clothes. I, I was the only one that wasn't aware that I wasn't wearing any clothes and I was being paraded naked down the street. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's the crazy part of, you know, I'm going to say being a late discovery is you end up having, at least for me, you and I've talked to a couple of others, and it's they they found the similar experiences. You end up having to reprocess virtually every relationship and every conversation you've had in your life based on the new filter that they were aware of this fact, and you didn't know they didn't know. You know, um, everybody else knew, or you know, who you got to figure out who else knew, who all knew, what did they know, how did they find out, you know. Um, yeah, your cousins must have known, and then you're not they're not supposed to tell you. They honored their parents, good for them. Uh, but, you know, it's it's crazy. I know. So it's hard to look back at that. And that's why I say the, the poor cousins. I feel bad for the cousins, you know. They, what, what were they gonna do? You know, they had their parents on one side and then me on the other, you know. And uh, it is what it is. Yeah. I don't know. I don't I, with both of them now. I'm fine with them. Have, yeah, have, so have that, pe- yeah, have people come forward and talk to you like, we're sorry, or they want to hear about it or, you know, have, how has that been? Well, it's, I'd say for the most part, um, you know, keep in mind, this was 20 years ago. Right. I was just going to say, wasn't this like the year 2000, mm-hmm. right? 2000, this was in the year 2000. Yeah. So initially when I found out, I would say they pretty much fell into thirds, one third um, said they, they, they felt bad for me and they were sorry that this happened. Um, but at the same time, they didn't really want to talk about it. <laughs> the, the second third um, basically acknowledged that it happened, but really didn't take a stance. And the final third found that I was doing a great dishonor to my parents by deciding <laughs> to look for birth family. Um, and we're very vocal about it, you know, in terms yeah. of how they do that to them. You know, I was disgracing them. I was a dishonor to, you know, their memory. They, they chose to do this and that was their wish. And how can I just throw away the love they gave me? <laughs> it was like, you don't have a clue. You don't know what you're talking about. No. So, you know, kind of go away, you know? And I'd say over, over the years, you know, and probably the, the relationships with those family members has shaken out accordingly. The, the ones that initially were, I'll say somewhat sympathetic, they've, some of them have read my book. Not all of them can quite do that. You know, some of them, I don't know, there may be one or two that have even listened to a podcast or two. I've yet to have one that'll come to like either a book signing or when I do a, a book reading, you know, at a local bookstore, they're, they're just not quite there yet. You know, um, they'll, they'll allow me to talk about it in the beginning. It was like, if I brought it up, conversations ended and we just had a kind of, maybe yeah. did, did anybody, movie. did anybody know the story? Uh, of your adoption or where, you know, anything, did you get any information from anybody or did you just have to go blindly on your own into this? Well, the, the only clues I got initially from that initial shakedown, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happened that night was my dad's sister. Uh, she was the one that came forward and um, she said, you know, it was my father that because of his time that he spent in the county home, he didn't want me to experience that horror of being an orphan, you know, and, uh, and we could have, we could go down another dissertation 
on the implications of that statement alone, you know, mm-hmm. and buys as a filter and how you're raising a kid, you know, it's just kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but then she also mentioned, she said, my father uh, mentioned at one point, she, he had put together that my father, my biological father was a professor. So that was, that, that were the only two clues I really had. Um, now, what I'm going to say is I, I did do, and I elaborate on it. I, I basically, my own self had kind of a come to God moment, come to Jesus moment. Um, I, we live really close to Lake Michigan and I, I did beach walks and would walk at night and um, just the pounding sand, um, you know, and I'll be out, the Northern lights were out at that night. Yeah. And there okay. were these misted pools that were just evaporating into these dancing sculptures. It was a crazy night out there. Um, and, you know, after that, 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 was, that was Sunday night and I had to go and teach high school because I was a high school teacher, a high school, middle school teacher at the time mm-hmm. on Monday. And luckily I had first hour prep. And so I knew that during my first hour prep period, um, I could call the county courthouse. This is how, you know, I am a guy who, even though I've had at, at this point in my life at 41, I've had some friends that have been adopted. And so I've casually heard about their stories through them, you know, to some extent, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. and I'm going to say the adoptees don't quite open up all the way to non-adopted, you know, um, there, there's, there's certain boundaries that, you know, I've seen exist there to some extent. And um, so I, I w- walked into this very blind and very naive and very stupid. And where I would say is, whereas, you know, the two of you are known from earliest memory adoptees, um, this, this would be the harder, you know, you've, you've had a lifetime worth of experiences to help you develop the ego that you need to shield you from some of the realities because mm-hmm. Monday morning when I called the county courthouse to say you know like okay this crazy thing happened at this family gathering my parents are dead but they claim I'm adopted is this true you know I'm still trying to comprehend and process and accept I'm not even there yet really and the only thing they could say at the county courthouse was your records aren't held at this building they're held at the state of wisconsin in the department of health and family and children's services Does well there's a confirmation that? i mean well i know but i'm stupid at the time i don't oh. get it oh. and, and, and so i'm like whoa why is that uh-huh. <laughs> and, and she just said you'll have to call them and, and they'll talk to you about it you know and so i called the the, the department and Again, I'm, I'm stupid, I'm naive, um, I don't understand my part in the play that I've just been assigned. And so the state had to spend the better part of an hour educating me to the fact that I don't have the same rights as everybody else to my birth information, that those records are not mine to view, that even though they can view them and look at them. I don't have that right. That, that's written into law that I'm not allowed to see those right now. Isn't and, that just uh, like insane? Can we it's, just say how insane this is? That just makes me mad. Go on. Well, um, <laughs> yeah. It's, and, and quite honestly, and, and I'm going to say, and, and the reason I tell you it this way is that was, that was almost as big of a blast as finding out I was adopted, finding out that now suddenly in society, I've, I've just been knocked down a run on the ladder, not through yeah. anything I did, you know? I mean, yeah, the rest of the population is like this, but for you, you're special. Yeah. And, and, and we have to protect other people from you. Right, <laughs> you know? God. So I've got, a, I've got a restraining order placed on me based on a birth status of mine. This is crazy, you know? I mean, so that was, that was probably, as big of a blow to me. And I think a lot of people don't quite understand that, you know, that, um, I like what you just, Fred, I like what you just said. You have a restraining order placed on you. I've never thought about it in that light. I guess all, all, all those of us relinquished at birth, all have restraining orders. I've never thought about in that light. It's to protect the others is to protect everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, that's, well, when you look at the adoption laws, they were written, you know, because the mother, and, and I, I'd love to be able to dive into that too, that the mother went through this horrific, shameful process where 
you know, she suddenly found because of this biological urge, you know, in most cases, she was part of that urge, it, you know, and some not, but, and I, I recognize that, but for the vast majority, she, you know, she, she had some part in that urge and suddenly, you know, found out that she's now become one of the most shameful creatures on earth. In mm -hmm. essence, you know, to some extent, I mean, as I've kind of wrapped my head around it, it's like, we witnessed the crime. We are the evidence of the crime. And so therefore we must be buried and hid away so that that crime can never be exposed. You know, that's, that's the structure that the law is currently written on in closed record states. Yeah. You know, you've got to protect the woman, let her sever her past that this never happened to her. And she can just forget about it in her memory and, and move on with life and remove her from, you know, that shame. So today what I'm really excited, you know, I, I mean, this was 20 years ago when I discovered all this and found out exactly who I was. Um, but today it's pretty exciting because I do see a lot more dialogue in it. I love the the analogy of, you know, trying to move laws from shame and secrecy into truth and transparency. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, when you start really boiling it down, you know, I mean, the current laws, all they do is enshrine that shame around that birth mother, mm -hmm. you know, for you know, Wisconsin, for instance. So they, when, once the state educated me appropriately, and I, I accepted my new role in the play, <laughs> I, I had to become somebody else once again. Um, you know, it, it was kind of interesting because I looked at it and for the most part, you know, they, they gave me a path and the path was I could apply for my non-identification information. If I applied for that and I got it, it's so the redacted file and I read the redacted file. Once I read the redacted file, I didn't know if they were going to quiz me on it or what, but they said, once you've read the redacted file, then you can write a letter to your biological mother you will turn that over to the state of Wisconsin. Um, we will read it to her over the phone. And if she accepts to release your identity, we'll let you know who you are. And if she declines, you have to wait five years and then you can reapply again. You can write her a new letter and see if that one's better. That's and crazy. Then if she declines that one, it's terminal. You don't get to apply again. Twice, you get twice. Twice, separated by five years. Mm. Mm. Who writes so, this stuff? I mean, like, what is that? These weird, <laughs> arbitrary laws. That, Meanwhile, uh, people die in five years and all sorts of things. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting because I, um, you know, I'll, I'll cut to some of the chase. So I did. Actually, I, I was listening to one of your podcasts and I can't remember his name. He was he was a, a gentleman, uh, just a kind of a terrible story. Um, I mean, he very happy guy. I know he was like Latino or something because he had a bit of an accent he referenced. Um, but he, um, you know, as I was thinking through his story, he went through and, and identified a, a, the of the wrong father. Oh, um, Jim. Yes. Yeah. Jim, Jim Serrano's story. Jim yes. Serrano. Awesome. What an awesome yes. story. You yeah. Know, and, and I actually, I did the same thing, but you know, the state, you know, and then they, you send your money in, you know, they, they tell you, they set the expectations. Okay. We'll get back to you in four to six months. Yeah. You know, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm holding my entire house up with no foundation with my hand alone. My arms getting tired. I need to build a foundation. You know, six months is kind of long to stand here like this. You know, I still also, can't, by the way, just the fact that we as adoptees have to pay for that. I remember <laughs> I had to pay like 250 bucks to my adoption agency to have them start the search. Just crazy. Yeah. Crazy. We've yeah. had guests who stopped looking because they were too broke at the time to pay. You know, they yeah, were young. Mm -hmm. and then, yeah. So anyway, I, I did. I, I went through a similar process to Jim, you know, where I, I, Pinned it on the wrong father. <laughs> I, it, it's interesting because I I come based on a slip of the tongue of the state worker, and that's that's the thing. You know, how would I say it? The the unofficial definition of bastard. You know, we all talk about bastard. We know what a bastard is. A bastard is a kid born out of wedlock. You know, we're all yeah. bastards. It's yeah. fine. I, I get it. Um, but uh, you know. You can take it and then we start assigning personality traits to the word bastard and they're never positive traits or anything. Well, look what you put us through, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, you make it so I have to call total strangers and, and quiz them 
in a way that they're not going to hang up on me to figure out if, you know, they can give me some clue or insight into who I really am. You know, I mean, it's kind of crazy. So there's a lot of acqu- acquiescing or whatever that, how you have acquiescing. to be acquiescing. We have to be the certain way you talk and thank you and help me. And, yeah. you know, I've had some of that myself and you're like, ah, that's not right. Yeah. Very much so. So I did actually, it was kind so of, so you crazy. wrote the letter. What's that? Did you write the letter to your birth mother? <laughs> I did write it and she did approve. Um, but again, it took, it took a few months and that was in the meantime, I actually, because I was, I was too impatient. I needed to find out. I, I needed to figure out what was going on. So I, I actually, because the caseworker missed, she made a mistake. She said I was born in Burlington but actually I was born in Milwaukee, but Burlington was right next to where, um, where place of birth was next to mother's residence. So I figured out she was from Burlington. So I then figured out based on the age she told me which graduating class she was in. So then I actually pinned it down to a graduating class, you know, went to the high school, picked out the pictures, looked at the story based on what I could figure out with the historical society and everything, identified this college professor who had been up at Lawrence University, because remember my aunt said he was a college professor, actually called one of his daughters, had her convinced that I was her half brother. I mean, we were we were doing <laughs> weekly calls, exchanging family information. You do have to get together with Jim because he had like, he had like dinners with his brother. <laughs> I know, I know. And so at the end, I had to call her and tell her, you know, I'm, I'm not really your half brother. And she was like, that's so sad. I like you so much better than my real brother. <laughs> Oh, so that's so funny. Finally felt wanted. Wasn't that great, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still so friends? Yeah. I hope you're still friends. I, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I need to reach out to her again. I want to send her a book. I haven't talked to her probably in 15 years. Oh. You know, she, she was, you know, it, it's an awkward situation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not your, I'm not your brother. Maybe we could date. <laughs> well, you don't even want to go down that path. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy when you, so I did find my mother. I met with my mother and I'm going to say, you know, it's interesting. Um, reunions, reunions are dicey, man. Uh, and everybody I talk to, some go really, really good. You know, there's a few out there that I've and notice I said the word few. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's more few and far between that, like it it matches the fairy tale dream that we all have, you know, that it, this is gonna be the great coming home. You know, I would say for me the, the biggest regret, you know, in reunion was my birth mother carried that shame and she could not let it go. She told me, she said, you know, if you would have come forward even five years earlier, my husband would have been alive. He didn't know, and there was no way he was gonna find out. So I so she, w- to, she wouldn't have written you back had he been alive. No, she, she would not have allowed me to find out who I was. She would have held that. You was know? she I mean, young when she had you? She was 22. Okay. You know, not 16-ish, but 22, you know. Um, yeah. And then she, after she had me, she uh, moved out of state, uh, got married, and um, had three children. Uh and one, and I, I met two of them. One of them died young. My biological mother had um, a disfiguring condition, uh, neurofibromatosis. I don't mm-hmm. know if you know what that is, um, but you know, and I'm not was, familiar with what that is. Um, it, it's benign skin tumors that pretty much cover you. You know, mm-hmm. so if you see older people with a lot of uh, just bumps, just bumps all over hands, face, everywhere. That's neurofibromatosis. So, and my birth mother had it. It's a disease that it's a 50-50 genetic proposition where either you get it or you don't. Um, it just depends which genes she passed, you know? And so for me, in my case, I did not get it. What about um, your children? Well, if you, if you don't, if you get it, you will display. You don't, it, it's not a recessive gene. So if, if, if I carry the gene, it will show. And okay. it basically starts to show in early puberty and then oh. manifests itself as you go through life. And um, two of her children had it and uh, two of them do not. And I say that uh, because it can shorten lifespans. And um, I had a half sister through her that died when she was 20 um, mm. from a complication of it. And then I had a half brother who I did meet once um, 
I think it was only once I met him. Um, and he had it, uh, and he died early. Um, I think he was about 50 when he died from a complication. From That's it. too bad. And are you Maybe close to the other brother? Do you keep up with the him? Other sister? Oh, uh, sister. It's a sister. Well, see, and that's why I say the, the reunions get complicated. Yeah. They're not they're not quite you know a, a, a fairy tale. Um, so my mother, with her shame, even though her husband had passed away, she still couldn't come to terms with it in relation to her community, um, the rest of her family, people that didn't know. She she didn't want anybody that didn't know to find out. So that was that was the term that she agreed to. You know, because I, in my letter, said I'll, I'll agree to whatever terms you want. I was desperate. I didn't, you know, I wasn't in a position to negotiate. Mm -hmm. You know, my head wasn't there, and so I agreed. And so she had told, she told her daughter, and she told her son. Um, her son, her daughter knew before that. Um, her son did not, and her son. It took a while for him to to come around to the idea. So it, it was probably about six months before I met him because he just didn't want to really look at that. He didn't want to deal with it. Um, my biological mother, um, when we would get together, she was fascinated by my kids. You know, I had I had three kids. She had one other grandchild. Um, her, not, neither of her other two children produced. Um, so all of a sudden here I show up and I've got three kids of my own, you know. And so she she just became enamored with my kids. Part of the problem, and you know, I think especially as if you're later in life, you know, and then you pop up at your mother's door, I look a lot like my biological father. Mm -hmm. And that that can bring its own set of baggage. You yeah. know, all of a sudden, here she's looking into the eyes of this guy that Well, what was that? Him. What was their story? Mm -hmm. Well, she was she was a, a teacher in the community. So she was teaching fourth grade in the uh, community. He was- And here uh, you were a teacher. I know. Huh? <laughs> Funny how that all works. Yeah. Uh, there's more stories there too. Um, he was a construction worker. He actually worked, um, he was working on an addition in a school in her community. And somehow they met. Um, they, from what I, I could read in the adoption file, and she confirmed they had dated probably about a year. Um, and then she, she had gotten pregnant. And, uh, you know, her story, when I told him, you know, he said, well, I guess I could marry you, but I don't know that we won't get divorced. Um, so less than romantic, whatever that was, you know, it, it didn't woo her in a way that motivated her to want to stay with him. And he certainly, he offered that I could be, you know, if she wanted to give it up for adoption, that I could be given to his family. Um, because he had, you know, and this is where it, it's quite remarkable. Um, you, you dive into the, again, generational trauma of the families that, you know, create these situations. And he had come from a situation where his father <coughs> had actually, his, his mother left his father when he was three. Um, and that was from Northern Missouri. She went back to Oklahoma. Um, and then within two years, his father died. And there, there was rumors that it was a suicide. And so then he ended up, his mother couldn't take care of him in Oklahoma anymore. So she sent him back up to his grandparents up in that community where his father theoretically committed suicide. So he grew up there, but he struggled in that, those relationships. So then he kind of got bounced back and forth between grandparents and aunts of his, you know, dead father. Yeah. I mean, so you look at it and it's like, well, there's a heartbreaking one all in its own, you know? Yeah. Um, and he had passed away before I found him, before I even found he was alive. So, but yet he's the one who said maybe you could stay with his family, which is, Crazy. you know, mm -hmm. and that that family, you know, I've I've met many, many, many in that family. It's a fascinating family. That the pieces that I put together during those searches of who the families were and where they came from and where they came out of. And um, because they, they were both very fascinating families. Uh, from her side, I'm primarily Norwegian from some of the first Norwegian immigrants in Wisconsin. Um, so there's a cemetery that I haven't been down to and I'm, I'm dying to get down there. I just found it not too long ago. Um, it's just south of the Milwaukee Metro. Three generations of my grandparents are buried there, you know, and it's, like, I just, I want to go check it out. I mean, man, yeah. that's, 
that's like these old Norwegian, you know, Vikings are, they're down there. It's kind of cool, you know? That's very cool. Yeah. And, um, and there's actually up in um, Browning, um, around Browning, Missouri, uh, Sullivan, that's another town, I think that's up there. Um, there there's a, a, another cemetery, I think that's got four generations of the Brookshires up there, you know, and then both families, uh, and then he was also part, my biological father was part of an Owens, um, the Owens family out of Oklahoma, who actually have two of two of my grandmother's siblings are in the Grand Old Opry Hall of Fame, believe it or not. <laughs> um, they, they were country Western singers and performers and uh, traveling musicians. And so that's what my grandmother ended up le leaving her son, my father, behind for because she wanted a life on the road and um, she didn't want to raise a kid. She abandoned them. Mm. Yeah, and it, it is what it is. She, yeah, did, you know, did, did he go on to have children? My, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it thickens here. So um, yes, he did. He married once after, uh, and a lot of the book is about me trying to find out about these families and find out about him. I think because he had passed away before I could actually meet him, it may have, I'm going to say, exasperated the desire to try and identify with that side of me. Mm -hmm. So I, I became desperate to find out what I could. And I, I dug hard. I dug deep. You know, this is back in 2000. So I didn't have as much with the internet. A lot of it was telephone books and phone calls and, you know, mailing away for death certificates and trying to put the pieces together. But I did find this one website. It was Descendants of Joseph Owens. And it dated actually the families all the way back to the mid 1600s in this country. So arriving like in some of the early ships. So there's, there's a lot of relatives like I've got a great 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 grandfather who actually was the one that purchased the farmstead in northern Missouri when he returned home from the Civil War you know and I mean it's just fascinating to learn some of this stuff and then there's actually two of his cousins actually fought against each other because Missouri was a split state at yeah. the time so one was fighting for the south one was fighting mm -hmm. for the north we have a lot of family that came out of the south so you know half half the roots that I've met are actually out of either Texas, there's an entire grocery store chain down there, Brookshire Brothers, um, that is out of that family. It, so it, it's fascinating. And that was what allowed me to actually put my foundation back together, to actually have a piece put, put together some puzzle that made sense to me that, you know, I fit into, uh, mm -hmm. that I could actually stand on and gave me that feeling of being able to stand on my own two feet. And that took six years. It took a long time to do that. I mean, you've done so much putting it together. But I'd so like did, to read the did book. you did you have siblings through through him? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I I, I I'm <laughs> oh, <that's bad>. okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know. Um, so yeah, so after he after he left my mother, um, he went to uh, he went back to Chicago. He married in Chicago. He married a woman who was older than him, supposedly. Um, she was she had a fair chunk of money. He ended up. Um, she bought him a bar to manage in the downtown Chicago loop. Uh, apparently his, he wasn't able to maintain his spirit control very well. So that was a failing business. And uh, he subsequently went to work in some of her other businesses. She was a beautician. She owned uh, beauty parlors around the Chicago area. And uh, so he became a beautician, believe it or not, after being a construction worker and then um, a beautician. So that, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah, now, the switch. now the guys, I'm going to say the guy's less than stellar, you know, and, and keep in mind, I'll say, bear in mind, we, we're talking generational trauma. So give him right. some space. So anyway, he, um, he, he married, he married one, he then divorced his wife, married one of his clients. Um, that marriage didn't last too long. They had two children. He apparently was abusive in many regards. So mm -hmm. she left him. She took the kids and ran away. She actually left to Ohio without even telling him where she was going with the kids. Um, and then he lived out the rest of his days from what I could tell in Ohio. He eventually became a cab driver and he died at the age of 60 in the uh, lobby of the Hilton at the uh, O'Hare airport. So, um, and that, that story eventually got out of his half brother um, who had most of his, his last belongings. And there's another story there I do want to tell you. So there were the two half brothers and I did meet those two half brothers. One is, um, 
uh, I'm gonna say six years younger than me, that's John. And then the other is I think two years younger than him. So eight years younger than me. Um, so as far as I knew from him, I had three or two other brothers uh, and that was it. And then on my mother's side, I had the brother and two uh, sisters. What was interesting is, you know, I went through my period of recovery um, and then kind of reemerged, emotionally got to a place where I decided I needed to get my book out there because I felt strong enough to um, tell my story and mm -hmm. do it in a public manner and felt I, I drive and need to do that. Um, and as I'm getting ready to do the final sign off, this was 10 months ago, uh, I'm, I'm going through my emails and all of a sudden something pops up through because I did do my verifications of who my genetic family are. Believe it or not, as late discovery, you end up with trust issues. You yeah. don't really trust people too easily. Right. So I, I needed verification. So I did tie, you know, based on who I met, where they were, you know, in the databases, I figured it out. I, I learned how to use those databases to, to figure out who people are in your family. And uh, all of a sudden, this woman shot me an email from Ancestry. She said, we're first cousins, and I don't know who you are. And I'm really curious because my father was adopted, but he never searched for family. So I started doing the checking and I started pulling her in, comparing her to my other relatives that I had already confirmed and figured it out. Her father was my half brother. My biological father had another child that uh -huh. was given up to adoption seven wow. months before I was born. Two of you seven months there. before you were born? Seven months before I was born. Ah. He was active. Yes, he was. I was going to say he's getting around. It, he, he was using what I'd call an alternate family planning model. <laughs> wow. So so where is this half brother now? Yeah. Unfortunately, he died at the age of 50. Oh, a lot of that. I know. Now, what gets really interesting, and here's where I'm going to, and I'm thinking about, I, I want to do an article on it because I think it's a powerful story. Um, but so you start putting the pieces together. My, my father died, my, bi my biological father died of a, a massive heart issue in the lobby of the Hilton at the age of 60. My half brother um, died at the age of 50 from a massive heart at issue. He had, he had bad health habits, smoked and mm -hmm. drank. So did my biological father. And in my past, so have I. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden I started doing, looking at these pieces following the trail of breadcrumbs, realizing my blood pressure is already through the roof. Guess what? I've cleaned up my act. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're, you're stopping the, uh, the cycle. I'm trying to, I'm trying to. So we want you around for a long time. So keep that going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, <laughs> so are you, um, just to final sort of few wrap up questions, a, um, you stayed in touch with your birth mother until she died. Yes. So okay. here's, here's where it gets at, you know, even, even, you know, we, we, we reconnected, she struggled with me a little bit, we had some good heartfelt conversations. Um, but anytime we'd meet in a restaurant, I was to come in with my family in the back door, we were to sit down somewhere, <laughs> she would come in through the front door and find us. She didn't want anybody to put it together that we had passed, you know, that we were related. When she died, she gave her daughter strict instructions, do not tell him I've died. Um, she didn't want me at the funeral. She was afraid people would figure it out. Okay. That's just sad. That makes me so sad. It is what it is. And, it is. But just know, that she has to feel that deep of shame, you yeah. know? And that's why I say, you know, I, I look at the laws we have in place today and that's where mm -hmm. my energy is getting focused. We look at the laws and what do those laws do? Yeah. They heard us adopt these. We were not allowed to figure out who we are. And for me, that was an intricate, that, that was, an essential building block of putting together a whole new foundation. And not only did it affect me, it affected my wife, who eventually I divorced from. It affected mm -hmm. my kids. It affect, you know, it affected so many people. And when you look at the structure of the laws themselves, I mean, just the way that you have to, you, you're totally guarding the shameful side of this secret. That's what the whole structure of the law is based around. Well, and it's and also it's based on protecting the adoptive parents. They they are the they are the first priority in these archaic laws. Well, and, and what I'm going to say is the real cost then, you know, I think, I think I would say it costs the adoptive parents as well too, because they lose the opportunity to have that meaningful relationship with their adoptive child. Cause that relationship I believe can be something 
a whole lot more special than probably what it was. Yeah, really open and beautiful. Yeah, mm-hmm. get to know each other. Get to really, 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 really grow mm-hmm. deep, to grow into it, to embrace it. You know? I have one question before we end that I don't know that um, I know a little from what you wrote us, but did you ever feel as a young person different than your family? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, you, did it make sense later? Like, oh, yeah. 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 Um, so, OK, so I. I'm if you do my DNA and you look at me, it, it all kind of puts together. It, it makes sense. As a kid, I was blonde. I was tall. I was thick. I was blue eyed with red highlights. I looked Norwegian and Scottish <laughs> and English, and that's what I am. Mm-hmm. I look, I, I am that, and I looked like that. My parents were both Eastern European, basically from Romania and Poland. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if you look at, think about who's the most renowned character out of Romania, Dracula. So it was kind of like Thor trying to play Dracula. It just <laughs> didn't Thor. work. You know, it just <laughs> didn't work. You know, I know those are cartoon characters and it's kind of making light of the situation, but there's physical uh, cues that I, I, I just missed. You know, I was leaps and bounds taller than both of them. You know, um, they were dark. I was light. Um, I was blonde. They were brown. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing that really made sense. But again, that, that's kind of, to me, an example of how, you, how your mind protects you. You know, it, it holds those secrets for you until mm-hmm. you can deal with them and process them. So, yeah. Wow. Well, this has been really quite the conversation. Really. <laughs> it really has. Enjoyed having you. And I feel like we could just go on and on all day. But can, I, can I give have- you one short closing story? Or Yes. 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 Okay. So, and, and I'm not going to kill too much of the book here because the book goes so far beyond it, but. So long, 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 long story short, um, a lot of the book is trying about trying to find Uncle Ron. Ron is Don's brother. Um, Don is my father. And, and Ron is the one that signed his death certificate. So I thought if anybody could give me clues, tell me, are there any other siblings, know anything else about who this person was that I was, you know, um, born out of, um, not born from, but he, he had his hand in it, um, it would be Ron. Eventually I found Ron. And it, it was a long, hard path to find Ron, full of family dysfunction and <laughs> sisters that weren't talking to brothers and until that could break. Then I could maybe get in over here and you know get a conversation. So finally I found Ron. It turned out Ron not only had Don's final belongings, he had Don. He had the oh. ashes of Don. Don was sitting in a, a storage unit down outside of San Antonio, Texas for the last 20 years. So I offered because what I had found about Don is, is I knew Don was um, a a very, he he loved Wisconsin. He loved getting up and escaping in Wisconsin. It was one of the things I found uh, actually talking to one of his old bosses. Um, And so I, and you were drawn to that too. So there you go again. Yep. And, and so I was, I, I went down and I got the, the final belongings of Don Brookshire, my father, and I was bringing him home. And um, before I opened the box, uh, this was back when I was drinking, Ron and I got quite honestly shit faced together. <laughs> um, and we came back and I knew I was too drunk and emotional to go through the box of Don's belongings um, at the time. So I decided I'd wait till the morning before everybody, I'm an early riser. I got up early in the morning, started opening the box, and I knew Don was an avid bowler. All of a sudden, here's his bowling bag. It says Don Brookshire on the tag on the bowling bag. I I open up the bowling bag, pull out the bowling ball. Okay, I have to set a context. My mother never told my father whether I I was a boy or a girl. My first birth name was Stephen Walter. It wasn't Fred. I look at the bowling ball. Guess what the name on the bowling ball is? Stephen. Fred. Wow. Fred. That's weird. Let that soak in for a while. <sighs> crazy. There's so it many bizarre crazy. coincidences yeah. with adoptees. Stories like this. It's really Did amazing. you spread his ashes or do you have his ashes or what I'll happened? I'll send you a copy of the book. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, listeners, we'll we'll put a link for this. So make sure you get it. <laughs> Brad, yeah, thank like you so much. This has been a really enlightening, incredible conversation. Thank you really for coming enjoyed on you. And telling yeah. us. Yeah, you guys are great. I, I want you to keep up your great work. I, I really am enjoying listening to your podcast. You guys do an awesome job at Thank just bringing you. The stories. You have a very good style um, and I appreciate your work. It's it's much needed work and it helps. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Fred. much. Thanks, we'll talk Fred. to you soon. Stay Thank in touch. You. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.